Father, we pray for your help, your blessing, your opening of our eyes, the application of your word to our life. We pray that you would be glorified, Lord, as you speak to us through the word. May the Holy Spirit be the teacher today. We depend upon him, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Revelation 2.8, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, The first and the last, who was dead and has come to life, says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, parenthesis, but you are rich, and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. I want to read to you a true story. This is a story that happened in the year 155 AD. It happened to a man who was a disciple of the one John, who was actually receiving the instructions from Jesus in this revelation. So it was John the Apostle's disciple. His name is Polycarp. 155 AD. He's going to go on to become the bishop of Smyrna, the, the churches of the city of Smyrna. And in 155 AD, a warrant had been issued for his arrest by the Roman authorities because he would not confess that Caesar is Lord and he would not offer sacrifice to Caesar. And so his congregation, who loved him, pleaded with him to flee the city of Smyrna for his own protection. And eventually he agreed to do that. So he did flee from the city. However, eventually one of the young servants in his household betrayed him when that servant was faced with torture. So they, they told the authorities where Polycarp was. They found him in an upper room of a farmhouse. Polycarp made no attempt to flee or to run. He's 86 years old at this point, so he's not going to be able to run very fast anyway. Instead, he, he kindly offered food and drink to his captors. And then he said, the will of God be done. He asked permission to retire to pray from the authorities, and they granted him permission. So he prayed for two hours. He was resigned to his death because sometime previously he had had a dream in which his pillow was on fire. And he woke up and he told the people around him that he must be burnt alive. He was placed on a donkey by the police, and he was taken back into the city. And on the way back, the police officer who was in charge urged him to recant on account of his great age. He was an old man at this time. And the police officer said, what harm can it be to say Caesar is Lord and to offer him a pinch of incense and be saved? But Polycarp refused to listen to him. When he entered the arena, there came a voice from heaven. Now this is tradition, but this is what they say. A voice from heaven came and said, be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. He was placed before the proconsul, who gave him an ultimatum, either to curse the name of Christ and make sacrifice to Caesar or die. Polycarp replied, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The proconsul threatened him. I've got wild beasts. If you will not change your mind, I will throw you to them. Polycarp replied, Call them. For repentance from the better to the worse is not permitted us, but it is noble to change from what is evil to what is righteous. The proconsul threatened again, Since you make light of the beasts, I will have you destroyed by fire unless you change your mind. Polycarp replied, You threaten me with the fire that burns for a time and is quickly quenched, but you do not know the fire which awaits the wicked in the judgment to come and in everlasting punishment. Why are you waiting? Come, do what you will. So the proconsul, seeing that he would not recant, gave word to his herald, who proclaimed three times, He has confessed himself to be a Christian. That was his crime. The mob was made up in large part of Jews. Remember that for the latter part of our text today. 
who were very antagonistic towards Christians. They shouted back, This one is the father of the Christians, the destroyer of our gods, who teaches many not to offer sacrifices nor to worship. They began to shout that he should be burned alive. When the proconsul announced his death by burning, it was the Jews who with extraordinary zeal gathered wood for the fire even though it was a Sabbath day. <laughs> They're breaking their own law to, yeah. to gather food, wood to, to burn them alive. Polycarp stood by the stake asking not to be fastened to it. He who grants me to endure the fire will enable me to remain on the pyre unmoved without the security you desire from the nails. They're, they're going to use nails to fasten him so he couldn't walk, or jump out of the fire. And he said, don't worry about it. I'm going to stay. God will give me the strength I need to stay right here. The fire was lit, but the flames arched up like the sails on a windy day of a ship. So that's what the fire looked like, like an arch over him. Rather than kill him, the flames just prolonged his sufferings. Finally, when it was seen that the fire was not going to kill him, the executioner was commanded to run him through with a spear. And so there he died, having bled to death. The Christians asked for his body to show it their respects, but the request was denied at the vehement request of the Jews. His burnt body was laid on the ground and lit on fire, until all that remained was his charred bones. This was the bishop of the church of Smyrna, which we're reading about today. Now, the scene of the martyrdom was a city about 40 miles from Ephesus, the last one we just read about, Ephesians 2, 1 to 7, about 40 miles from Ephesus, up the road, a place called Smyrna. And today I want to study with you the message of Jesus Christ to the Christians that lived in that particular city. It's unique because it's the shortest of all of the seven letters. There's only four verses to it. And it's also unique that usually Jesus has a word of correction for each of the churches, but there's no word of correction for this particular church. This was a holy and a pure church probably because they were undergoing suffering. And suffering has the tendency to purify the church. So let's take a real close look at what Jesus had to say to this particular church. And we're going to do the same thing every time as we go through these seven letters. There's the uh, recipients, then there's the author, then there's the commendation, then there's the, there's the correction. There's not really one today. Instead of a correction, there's an exhortation today. And then there's finally a promise. So first of all, the recipients. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, right. So let's talk a little bit about the city that this took place in. If you were a postal carrier, a man who worked for the post office and you were delivering seven letters, <laughs> you would start in Ephesus and you'd go from there to Smyrna and you'd keep going in like a horseshoe and you'd end up at the bottom. So this was a route that someone who's carrying these seven letters would go. First he's going to go to Ephesus, then to Smyrna, and he's going to keep going, and he's going to end up in the final one, which is Laodicea. Um, the characteristics of Smyrna were interesting. It was the most culturally sophisticated of all the cities of Asia. If Ephesus was San Francisco, then Smyrna would be Monterey. It was a place of beauty. It was a coastal city. It was a center for literature and the arts. In fact, Homer was born and raised in Smyrna. Homer was the one who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. These are books that I read when I was in high school. I don't remember exactly what they're all about, but they're, they're classics that have survived hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, it was famous for its, its athletic games, and it was a city of beauty and wealth. And running through the whole city was a famous street called the Street of Gold. On both ends of the street, you had Roman temples to their gods, but in the midpoint of the city, this street encircled Mount Pagos, P-A-G-O-S. So think of the city, and then the, this, this, this mountain goes up 500 feet, and on the top of this mountain are all these really interesting, well-designed buildings. There's even um, photographs that you can get online and, and look at what at Mount Pegas and the cities on top of it, at least the ruins of, the, of the, uh, the buildings that are on top of it. So here you've got this street of gold. It goes from one Roman temple 
up here at its midpoint, it winds around this mountain, and then it goes to the other uh, Roman temple the, on the other side. It was said that from a distance, this street of gold encircling the mountain was designed to look like a necklace on a goddess because the mountain was like the neck and this street was like the necklace. On top of the mountain are these beautifully designed buildings and they referred to those, those buildings on top of the mountain as the crown of Smyrna. Later we're going to read about a different crown that Jesus offers to give his faithful disciples, the crown of life. The city was first built about 1000 BC and it was destroyed about 300 years later and it lay in ruins for another 400 years but then it was revived by the successors of Alexander the Great who rebuilt the city. So it existed at one time, it died, it lay dormant for a period of hundreds of years and then it was resurrected which is also I think probably significant that Jesus in this particular letter talks about himself being the one who first died and then was raised to new life. In fact, the people of the ancient world identified Smyrna with the phoenix. Are you familiar with that? It was a mythological bird, a creature, who is said to live five or six hundred years in the Arabian desert and then it would die being burned on a, a pyre, uh, a, a fire there, but then it, it would rise from its ashes and be resurrected and live another 500 years and go through the same process over and over. So they, they looked at Smyrna as, as the phoenix of the ancient world. Now let's look at the author. Of course we know who the author is, but let's look at a des description of Jesus Christ who is the author here. Jesus takes a description of himself from chapter 1 verse 17 and 18. And that's where John writes, When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Well, here we have to the letter, or excuse me, in the letter to the church of Smyrna, Jesus describes himself as the first and the last who was dead and has come to life. He takes it right out of chapter 1. So he calls himself the first and the last, which is an interesting description because Jehovah God, several times in the Old Testament, identifies himself. This is Jehovah God, the Creator God, as the first and the last. I'll give you a couple of examples. Isaiah 41.4 I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am He. Or Isaiah 44.6 Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last and there is no God besides me. That's how God describes Himself. Jesus describes Himself in exactly the same way that Jehovah God of the Old Testament describes Himself. So of course the only conclusion we can arrive at is that Jesus is Jehovah. And that is the Jehovah Witnesses' worst nightmare. Yeah, yeah. True. So if Jesus is the first and he's the last, it must be that he's the one who never had any beginning, unlike everything else that exists. He has no beginning because he just is. He is life itself. He, he didn't come into being, he's always existed. He's the one who has life in himself. He's the source of life for everything that exists in the universe that has life. And he says here, I was the one who was dead and has come to life. And of course he's talking about his crucifixion and his resurrection. And I think it's interesting that he identifies himself as the one who is dead and has come to life for a couple of reasons. First of all, he's identifying with the city. The city died and was resurrected, just as we mentioned a moment ago. And so in that respect, Jesus can identify with the city that they live in. But I think the most important reason that he uses that self-designation is because it's going to be an encouragement to suffering Christians. Jesus Christ was the one who suffered to do the will of God. But he came alive again. His death wasn't the end of the story. It was just the beginning of the story. He was raised to life. He ascended to the right hand of God just like our opening scripture, he has the name above every other name. God exalted him, and I think Jesus is trying to give 
himself as an example to these suffering Christians. If you follow my example, this is what you have to look forward to. God is going to exalt you. God is going to raise you and exalt you to his right hand. So if they're faithful until death, God will give them the crown of life. So there we have the author, the recipients, but let's look at the commendation. Verse 9. In every one of the letters, Jesus says, I know. I know this about you. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So let's just stop there for a minute. He knows several things about them. He knows their tribulation. So that word tribulation refers to a great pressure. Something that brings distress. Something that brings affliction. I know about it, he says. Smyrna was going through great suffering. The Christians there for their faith. The ones that would not deny their faith and would not renounce Christ were going through a period of suffering. And the wonderful thing is that Jesus says, I'm not oblivious to this. I know all about what you're going through. I weep when you weep. Remember when he said to Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? He knew all about the suffering, the persecution that the early church was facing. And he says, you're doing it to me because I am so linked with my body on earth that you cannot, you cannot harm my body without me feeling it. So Jesus knows all about the suffering of his people. And he knows all about whatever suffering you're facing today. He knows it. He has compassion on you. There might be reasons why he has not delivered you or rescued you out of it as of yet, but that doesn't mean he doesn't know about it, and it doesn't mean he doesn't love you and he's not compassionate towards you. And in due time, when the right time comes, he will deliver you from it. And then he says, and I also know about your poverty. But interesting, I love this, but you're rich. Now physically, yeah, you're poverty stricken, but spiritually, you are rich. And there's two different Greek words for the word poor in the Bible. One is penes, P-E-N-E-S. And it's the usual word for someone who is poor, but they have nothing extra, but at least they have enough to get by. They have enough to, to survive from day to day. They have enough food. They have clothing. They've got shelter. That's the word penes. But then there's this other one, and I don't even know how to pronounce it, so I'll spell it. It's P-T-O-C-H-E-I-A. Tokaya, maybe. That's my best effort at this. This word's a little bit different. This word means you don't have anything. It's not that you have just enough to survive. You don't have anything. You're destitute. You're a beggar. Like the fellow that was begging at the uh, beautiful gate, he would be, they, they would use this word to describe him. He didn't have enough to get by. He had... He had nothing, and so he had to beg just to make it from day to day. He was destitute. And that's, what the, that's the word that the Lord uses here, the second one. I know your poverty. In other words, they were in extreme straits. It wasn't just that they had to work hard and just, you know, paycheck to paycheck. I can barely pay my bills. It's, no, it wasn't that. It was that they were really suffering deeply because of this physical poverty that they were enduring. But the Lord says, you're rich. Now to the church of Laodicea, they said, we're rich. And the Lord says, you're poor. I'd rather the Lord say I was rich than for me to say I was rich and he would say I was poor. And they were physically poor, but spiritually rich. They were rich in faith, rich in love, rich in holiness, rich in purity, rich in grace, rich in hope. Rich in all of the things that really matter. They were rich in those things. And James says that God has chosen those who are uh, poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom of God. And that's what the, the Christians in Smyrna were like. They were rich in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now why do you suppose that they were poor? I know your tribulation. I also know your poverty. My best guess is that it was because of the persecution they were facing. Because we know from the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 10, verse 34, it says, 
You showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. So the Christians that received this Hebrews letter, they were going through persecution and they were having their possessions seized. They accepted it joyfully. Probably that was happening here with the Christians in Smyrna. That because they, were, they refused to bow down and to capitulate to the demands of Rome, Rome could do, they could exact, exact their, their property, their possessions, and now they find themselves in extreme poverty. And then the third thing that Jesus knows about them is the blasphemy. The blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now when you read through the book of Acts, and you read about the persecutions that came upon the early church, I believe in every case it was the Jews that were the ones bringing about the persecution of the Christians. And that would make sense because it was mainly the Jewish people that were being converted to Christianity. So the Jews were losing members to the Christians. In fact, it says a great number of priests became obedient to the faith in Acts chapter 6. So the Jews were, because they, they, they were seeing that Jesus Christ is our Messiah. Some of them were embracing Jesus as the one that their own scriptures had foretold. And so the Jewish leaders, when they saw that they were losing members to the Christians, were starting to get more and more angry and they would stir up the mobs against the Christians. But I, I find it re really interesting how Jesus describes the Jewish people. He says, I know the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews, but they're not. They say they are. They make a profession of Judaism, but they're not. They're really a synagogue of Satan. That's what Jesus says of them. Now, no doubt they had Jewish blood in their veins. Physically, they were descendants of Abraham. I would grant them that. But Jesus said, that's not what matters to me. Not your physical descent. Are you? Remember Paul in Romans chapter 2, he tells us what a true Jew is. A true Jew is not one who it was outward in the flesh, and circumcision is not that which is of the flesh. He says a true Jew is one who is circumcised in the heart by the Holy Spirit. And his praise is not from men, but from God. So a true Jew is one who has the, the circumcision of God upon his heart, where the Holy Spirit has come in to dwell within him. That's a true Jew, a true covenant person of God. And the Jews that were persecuting the Christians in Smyrna, they're really a synagogue of Satan. When the Jews rejected Jesus Christ, they apostatized from the true faith. I know some people today like to think that the Jewish people are somehow special. I, I, my understanding is that they're like anybody else that doesn't have Christ. They're lost just like Ethiopians or Chinese or Japanese or Americans that don't know Jesus. They're, we're all in the same boat. We're lost. We're headed to eternal destruction without a Savior unless we have Christ. Now, he says these Jews blaspheme the Christians. Jesus says, I know the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not. That word for blasphemy is usually used of say, saying something slanderous against God. But sometimes it is used of saying something slanderous against God's people. And I think that's probably the meaning here, because it fits the context. Why would the Jews slander the Christians? Well, what, could they do? what could they say about them? Well, they said all kinds of things. They slandered them by saying that they're cannibals. They actually said that because they talked about eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Christ in communion. They slandered them for sexual immorality because the Christians would greet each other with a holy kiss and they would hold their love feasts. And so they would say, well, they're guilty of immorality. They slandered them for rebellion and political disloyalty because the Christians would not burn a pinch of incense to Caesar and say Caesar is Lord. And so they would slander them. They would blaspheme the believers. So Jesus says, I know the blasphemy by those that say they are Jews and are not. So he knows all about the troubles they're going through. 
But let's notice the exhortation he gives to them. Verse 10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. That's the first one. Do not fear. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Second exhortation, be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Usually the churches are given a word of correction. There is nothing of that sort in this letter. Instead, we have a word of exhortation exchanged for a word of correction. And it begins with this, do not fear what you are about to suffer. So wait a minute. We already know that they were going through tribulation. We already know that they were dirt poor and destitute. We already know that they were being blasphemed or slandered by the Jews of their city. And now Jesus says, don't fear what you are about to suffer. In other words, the worst hasn't even come yet. What about those preachers who say that Christianity should be health and wealth and success in life and you shouldn't have troubles, you shouldn't have tribulations, you should be rich. They didn't read their Bible, did they? <laughs> and Jesus doesn't believe in that message because what does he tell the church? It's going to get worse, not better. But hold on till the end and I'll give you the crown of life. That was his message to this church. The devil, he said, is about to cast some of you into prison for 10 days. You're going to be tested. You're going to have even more tribulation. So evidently, God is giving the devil a pretty long leash here. He's giving him the permission to test these believers. And his test is going to include the martyrdom of some of them. Because that's why he tells them, be faithful until death. So sometimes God will give Satan permission to do some difficult things to, to Christians, the ones he loves. Why did he do it here? He says, I'm going to test. This is a test. Behold, the devil's about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested. Job was tested, wasn't he? That's what I was going to say. He lost all of his kids. I don't, was there 10 of them? There was a lot of kids that were killed. And his wife wasn't. And sometimes he wished she was part of the kids that died. <laughs> and he lost all of his property. He lost all of his sheep. Everything that meant uh, wealth for a person of that day. All of his lands and properties that were destroyed. God tested him. And sometimes God tests his own people. Why did he do it? It wasn't so that his children would squirm under their suffering as though he took delight in their pain. It wasn't because of that. It was because this test was necessary. Perhaps for them, they needed to know what they were made of. Are they overcomers or are they not? This test is going to prove if they get an A or an F. They're going to know after this test comes whether they're true or false believers. And it would also prove to the devil once and for all that he's not able to destroy true faith generated by the grace of God. That God will be victorious over Satan. But what about these 10 days? What does that, what does that mean? He says, um, you will have tribulation for 10 days. I'm going to throw some of you in prison. It's, it's difficult for me to know whether this is to be taken literally as a literal 10 days, which is very possible, or whether this is a symbolic number, which oftentimes in the book of Revelation they are. So I don't know. I really don't know if this is supposed to be 10 literal days, or it could simply be meaning a temporary but unspecified period of time. But either way, this isn't going to be permanent. This is a period of time that God is going to allow this testing to take place. Some of you will die in the process. Be faithful until death, and I'm going to give you the crown of life. Now don't picture the crown of life as a literal crown that when we get to heaven we put on this crown it says life on it and we walk around showing off our crowns. This is symbolic. This is the reward of faithful service to Jesus on this earth. You're going to ever inherit as reward for faithfulness everlasting life. Now of course that was purchased for you by the free gift of Christ at the cross but through faithfulness you demonstrate that you love Christ and that you are a true follower of Christ and he's going to award you everlasting life as, as 
a, a reward for your faithful obedience to him. When Debbie and I went to China in 2008, we had a, an interpreter, a guide. And she was telling us that it's looked on as a very high honor to be a martyr for Christ amongst the Chinese people. And in fact, she wanted to go to North Korea as a missionary because she knew that she would die for her faith if she, if she actually did this. If she got into North Korea and started to evangelize, she would be executed for her faith. And she, that was her, her she, this is the highest honor in her mind. And so that she wanted to do that. Now we, here in America, we're, we don't have the same perspective, do we? <laughs> we want to avoid suffering. But for them, that's just, they have a different perspective on it. There's only so many martyrs. In fact, in chapter 6, when the last one has been martyred, Christ returns. There's a specified number that God knows of. And for her, she wanted to be one of them. Jesus said in Luke 12:4. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. So Jesus says, if they kill you, that's all they can do. It might hurt for a little while. You might suffer for a period of time, but then it's over, and you're in everlasting glory forever. And that's all they can do. So fear God, don't fear man. And then Jesus says, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What does it mean to have an ear to hear? Not everybody has an ear who can hear. This is spiritual ears, spiritual hearing. Remember when Jesus' family came to him because they thought he had gone crazy. He wasn't even taking time to eat. He was ministering to the crowds. And his mother and his brothers came to take him into custody and remove him. And um, Jesus replied, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. They have spiritual ears and they obey the word of God. So Jesus says, He who has an ear to hear, that is all born again believers, Listen to what I am saying. So this particular message is not just for that one church. This message is for all the churches. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So even though we in America are not facing death for our faith, there's something that we need to hear from this letter. And there's something that we need to apply. Now he talks about the Spirit speaking to the churches. But Jesus is the one writing. Did you know when Jesus gives a message, the Spirit is speaking? The Spirit is speaking through this letter, even though Jesus is the author, because they're inseparable. The Word of Christ is delivered by the Spirit and empowered by the Spirit. Now, let's look finally at the promise that Jesus gives. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. What is the second death? Well, this very same book, Revelation, if you go to the end of the book and look in chapter 20, verse 4, I'm sorry, verse 14, it says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So the lake of fire is eternal hell. It's not Hades. It's not the interim place of separation from God and punishment. It's the final, ultimate, eternal place of punishment and separation from God's graciousness. The lake of fire. And that's what the second death refers to. And Jesus said, the one who overcomes will not be hurt by it. They're not going to experience it. They're going to be delivered from it. They will never face it. So the first death... Remember, he mentions the second death, so there must be a first death. The first death is our physical death. The second death is our eternal death. Spiritual separation from God's love. So the one who overcomes is the one who's not hurt by the second death. Who's the one who overcomes? Do you remember from last time? 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5 say it's the one who's born of God and the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. In other words, it's a born-again believer. 
That's the one who overcomes. If you've been born again by the Holy Spirit, you're an overcomer. And you will be faithful until death. He'll give you the grace to do that when it's necessary. You may not have that ability right now to go out and face a firing squad or a guillotine or whatever it is. But in the moment of your need, if you are a child of God, I believe God is going to give you the grace to face death rather than to renounce Christ. There have been hundreds of thousands of Christians over the centuries who have done just that. God has given them the grace in their dying moments. Yeah. Okay, so let's draw all of this down to a conclusion. You say, Brian, this just sounds irrelevant to me. I mean, I'm not facing death from my faith in Christ. I'm not having to declare Caesar is Lord. I'm not having to burn a pinch of incense. But if you speak up for God's truth, even though we live in a different age, a different culture, if you speak up for God's truth, you will face persecution today. Remember that for Rome, it was all about getting everyone in the empire on board. They didn't really care if you were a Christian or a Jew or anything else. They just wanted you to, be, to have an allegiance to the emperor and to the Roman Empire. They wanted everyone on board. And so burning a pinch of incense and saying Caesar is Lord was just a little token to make sure that everybody was on board and going the same direction, following the rule of Rome. The devil wants our allegiance. And he'll try to get it through getting us to compromise our convictions. Just like they would have to compromise to give Rome their allegiance. We, if we compromise, we give the world system our allegiance. And the devil will whisper that committing that sin is really no big deal. It's okay. Just go ahead and enjoy it. It's okay to go along with this new sexual revolution that is sweeping our country. Don't worry about it. It's not a problem. Just go ahead and use the preferred pronouns. Just go ahead and go to that gay wedding in the name of tolerance and inclusion. Just don't say anything about the LGBTQ agenda. Don't make waves. Don't say anything about the hundreds of thousands of innocent babies being murdered in our nation every year. Don't speak up when entire Christian denominations deny biblical truth and ordain gays into the ministry and officiate at gay weddings. Don't speak up about the sinfulness of people living together apart from marriage. Don't speak of the harm to people who go through sex change operations because they identify as the opposite sex. Just don't talk about any of that you won't face persecution but if you tell people the truth of the Word of God you're gonna be persecuted today you'll be canceled you'll be said that you're unloving you're intolerant you're not inclusive we don't want to have anything to do with you you're a bigot just because you try to accurately represent God's truth so if you want to avoid persecution don't speak God's truth when it intersects with popular culture Whatever the issue happens to be. The devil is saying, bow down to the opinions of the world. Pinch your incense to me. But if we do obey God and speak his truth, we will end up being slandered. We will end up with people being upset and enraged at us, just like the Jews were to the Christians of that day. And so really the issue for us today, the question is, Will we stand against the whispering temptations of the devil? Or will we compromise our convictions so that we don't have to face any backlash or any negative consequences of our actions? Will we side with God's word or will we side with the opinions of the world? I think it really comes down to that in the end. The choice is ours. What will we do? What choice will we make? I want to encourage you to be biblically minded Christians. Instead of thinking about how you can uh, refrain from offending anybody, think about how can I refrain from offending God in this situation? What does God want me to do? How would he have me to respond in this situation? And it may not be the politically right thing to do at that moment. It might be saying something that they're not expecting might get you into a little bit of trouble, but you might have a clear conscience with God Almighty in the end, rather than compromising. 
So may God give us grace to stand for Him, to stand for His truth, and to do His will, to properly represent Him in the world. And I thought at this point we could take some prayer time together because we are all tempted to compromise. And I thought maybe we could do that today. We could get into groups of three and we could just pray for one another that we would stand strong and not capitulate, not compromise our convictions, but actually be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. 